you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. guardians are Muslims and sometimes they do observe some prayer celebration in which a ram or chicken can be slaughtered. Sometimes the imam could instruct that they eat the whole meat at once. Pastor, can I refuse to partake from it? You can refuse to partake if it's, if it's religious. If it's sharing food at home, well, you participate at home. But if it's for religious rites, you can refuse if you want to. You can refuse. And no one will force you to eat something if you don't want to eat it.
capital punishment as a method of dealing with crime today. And as a believer, what more can I do apart from praying and giving towards the prison ministry to reduce the incidents in my country and the world at large? Well, when you consider the heinous crimes committed by offenders who have to face capital punishment, sometimes you realize that that might be the only way to deter them from such crimes. The problem with capital punishment is the imperfection of human judgment. The human justice system doesn't provide a flawless way of determining who the real culprit is. There's where the problem lies. The possibility of punishing the wrong man. And throughout history, the wrong people have been punished for crimes. See, crimes they never committed. And so, if you happen to kill a man for a crime he didn't commit, you've got a problem in your hands. Someone has rightly said, it is better to let a thousand criminals go free than to kill one man for a crime he didn't commit. So, um, all of those who fight against capital punishment want us to realize the danger of punishing the wrong man. Because you can't restore that which you may take from him, including his life. So that's the problem. Another thing is the possibility of change. Sometimes criminals who had a changed heart helped do much more than some of those who never committed any crime. So there are times that we may deprive ourselves of that which someone could have done for us and for the world just because he had committed a crime sometime in his life. So that's another big problem. So um, it's a debate that definitely will go on and on and on because you're trying to balance the, the need to, to deter would-be criminals from those terrible crimes against humanity against the backdrop of failures in the justice system. So, that's really the problem. That's really the problem. So that debate is going to go on and on. And then you sin intentionally. Will you be forgiven by God if you ask Him? If yes, can you please explain the quotation in Hebrews 10, 26 to me? Okay. First, I would read to you what you have in Hebrews 10, 26 and answer your question. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I'll read further. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, honored two or three witnesses. Of how much sorrow punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who hath now? You see, a lot of times when we take the, the word of God out of context, we miss the whole thing. See, if, if, you, if, if we were to stop in that verse 26, you lose the whole truth. Let me read the verse 26 that you were talking about. I won't read it again for you. And you see why you would miss it without reading further as I chose to do. Verse 26 says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. That's true. He's telling you there's no more sacrifice for sins. Now, he's not saying you will not be forgiven. But he's telling you there's no more sacrifice for sins. Now, what's the reason? He explains to you and then you get to know what kind of sinning he's dealing with here. 
So let's read. Again from verse 27. For a sudden fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law without, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sure a punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy? Shall he be thought worthy? Who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and had done despite unto the Spirit of grace? This is what he's saying this person has done. Which means acting defiantly. Defiantly. You know the word of God. And not only do you choose to do what is wrong, but you also reject the counsel of the Lord. And you also you despise the Lord Himself. Now you can see it. Of how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who had trodden on that foot the Son of God? So it's not just that someone knew that something was wrong and did it. No, that's not what he's talking about. Uh, otherwise, you're not tempted. If you don't know something is wrong and you do it, you probably weren't even tempted. But you see, a bona fide temptation means that you're allowed to do something which you know is wrong and you go ahead and do it. But you will always, a real child of God will have sorrow for sin. You, you'd always want to, to, to repent of it. But this person does not repent. He treads underfoot the Son of God. He doesn't repent. He rejects his Lordship. That's what he's talking about. So he's letting you know there's no other sacrifice because you're rejecting the sacrifice that has been made. He's telling you which other sacrifice are you going to get if you, if you tread underfoot the Son of God. If you reject the Son of God, so hey, where are you going to go? That's what he's saying. So he's not dealing with someone who, who, who told the lie knowingly. And then uh, he says, oh Lord, I'm sorry. This one, this kind of person does not accept the Lord. He rejects him. And, 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 and Paul tells you here, if you reject him, you don't have an option. That's what he's saying. So the first part of your question, if you are a Christian and you sin intentionally, will you be forgiven by God? Yes. Now, first of all, you, got to understand, you have to understand that um, sinning intentionally has two things. The first part of it is the intention to sin itself. That intention, before the sin is committed, the very intention to sin itself is a sin. So the sin started with the intention to sin, which is forgivable. Then the wrong itself, which is also forgivable. What is not forgivable here is the rejection of the Son of God that he says. That kind of sin. He says, how well, how are you going to get the forgiveness? The very sacrifice has been condemned by you. So where are you going to get the forgiveness from? So that's the argument that Paul is giving to us. So if, if you sin willfully or unwillfully, you can be forgiven depending on whether your acceptance of the Son of God as your Lord and Savior is still part of your faith. Do you still trust Him for that salvation? If you reject Him, if you tread underfoot the Son of God and count the blood of the covenant wherewith He was sanctified an unholy thing, you have no option. That's what He's telling you. There's no other way, there's no other blood for your forgiveness. Do when God gave you a specific word about healing, prosperity, and restoration, and seven years after it has not yet manifested. I believe the word I received, have been praying about it, declaring it, and expecting it, yet it has not manifested. The major thing that protracts God's promise, God's word of blessing to anybody, is unbelief. The Bible talks about the Old Testament people and how they could not enter into their promise. They, could, they couldn't enter into their rest. He says, because of their unbelief. It's always unbelief.
You may look at your life and say, oh, no, I, I, I was not believing. You may argue it. But the reality is, even from your very language, what you've written here, I can see unbelief in your writing. See? Because you're waiting for a manifestation. Faith doesn't wait for a manifestation. Real faith is a possessor. It takes a hold of the word that has come. You haven't taken a hold of it. See, when you take a hold of it, it's as much yours when you see it and when you don't see it. It's like the man who has the documents of a landed property. He doesn't need to see it before he knows it belongs to him. Once he has the documents, he can present it in the back. See? And so the, 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 the idea that uh, we've got to have a manifestation for us to have the faith complete is wrong. Otherwise, what is faith? Faith is calling real that which you have not seen. Faith is a title deed to unseen realities. It's a title deed. So the fact that you're still waiting, waiting for a manifestation to receive it, shows that you actually haven't embraced it. See? So what you actually have here is hope. You're still hoping for the healing. You're hoping for this prosperity. You're hoping for this restoration. And hope never gives you anything. Hope is satisfying. Hope is a great blessing. Hope is positive. It's a great virtue. Hope is wonderful. But hope doesn't give you anything. It's just what it is. Hope. A look into the future that excites you. But faith makes you a possessor. Faith brings what you've been hoping for into your today. Faith puts it into your hands. Faith brings it into manifestation. You are yet to transit from hope to faith. Maybe you thought you tried, but faith is not something you try. Faith is something you have. Faith is something you know. You see, because faith is a proof. You see, how could it be a proof when you're looking for another proof? If you have faith, faith is your proof. It is now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Your faith is evidence of your healing. Your faith is evidence of your prosperity. Your faith is evidence of your restoration. And until you have that faith in manifestation, what you're thinking about that you're hoping for to come into manifestation cannot be manifested. See, because your faith is still in the arena of hope. So let it transcend from believing to faith and from hope to faith. And this will become a testimony. Ministry, thank you. It's a blessing. My question is this. What does the Bible say about suicide? Is suicide a sin? Thank you. Yes, it is. And um, it's important for me to explain some thoughts to you. What's the cause of suicide? The main cause of it is selfishness, self centeredness. That's the cause self-love someone is probably frustrated with the society or frustrated about something or is in self-defeat and he thinks well i'll take my life no one takes his life joyfully no one says i'm so happy i want to kill myself often it is because of some depression of some uh, feeling of rejection something negative that you feel that you think and so someone might decide to take his own life because of because of that but is it okay no it's not okay and there's a reason for that i'll read to you from romans chapter 14 from verse 7 for none of us liveth to himself and no man died to himself for whether we live we live unto the lord and whether we die we die unto the lord 
whether we live therefore or die we are the Lord's simple so you live not for yourself but for the Lord and if you decide to die you can't kill yourself because your life is not yours the Bible says we're bought with a price we belong to Christ he says none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself as a seventh verse no man liveth to himself so if you don't live to yourself there'll be no reason to give up on life so you can't be that self-centered you've got to think about what the Lord thinks what's on his mind what's his purpose for your life have you fulfilled your reason for living why are you alive in the first place? Why were you born? Have you found out your purpose for life? You cannot take your life until you have fulfilled that purpose. And when you fulfill that purpose, it's up to the Lord to say, this is how this man ends up. So taking your life means that you've chosen to live to yourself. You've decided how long you want to live and you've decided when you're going to die and how you're going to die. That means you're dying to yourself. And this is all just wrong for a Christian. A Christian cannot take his own life so suicide is a sin I have just a short question what does the Word of God say about success in academics well it's what the Word of God says about success in everything else God can um, he can make you success in any year of your life. But then if you would study in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, from verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them. Among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Remarkable, remarkable. This was... Uh, an academic test in the Bible says that God gave to these four Hebrew boys knowledge he gave them skill in knowledge in all learning see he made them wiser than their peers God can give you such ability and by the way he's already done it it's whether or not you can acknowledge that whether or not you can open your mind to that Sophia the wisdom that God has given you Christ has been made unto us wisdom and wisdom opens your mind wisdom enlightens you wisdom gives you insight and foresight see can you apply this can you accept this can you put it to work that's what matters will you pay attention will you listen now when you study will you give it your your will you give it your best will you really attain to it because sometimes we have christian students who don't attain to what they're studying and so they, they don't get the best out. So it matters what you do with your study and with your listening when you're in class. So, yes, the Word of God does say a lot about success in your academics. If you would, if you would pay attention and put the wisdom of God that you have in your mind to work, you can start saying something. One of the things you can start saying or doing to open your mind, to open your uh, the, the, the capacity of your intelligence to a higher level is to begin to declare God has made me wise God has made me wise I'm intelligent I'm knowledgeable I have understanding you begin to say those things and as you say them your mind will open up and you'll find that you're understanding things like never before you find that you have an analytical mind and you can look through and through any subject because the Spirit of God can do that in you and for you.
saying, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And if your eye causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better to enter into the kingdom of heaven with one hand than to go to hell with your full body. Yeah, I want you to understand the teachings of Jesus. And many times, Jesus, Jesus brought our knowledge to his listeners in a way that they could understand exactly what he was saying. He wanted them to be able to ask certain questions and answer those questions from their own, uh, from their own reasoning about themselves. So sometimes he spoke in parables, many times he spoke in parables, but this is not a parable. What Jesus is saying here is very simple. I want you to listen to it because it was stated several times. From what you, what you wrote here is actually what you have in the Bible. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. In another portion, it says, if your hand offends, offends you, which means the same thing causes you to sin, cut it off. And if your eye causes you to sin, the question you should ask is, can your hand cause you to sin? Can your eye cause you to sin? Jesus said something one time, the, the Jews came to him and they said, uh, uh, Rabbi, we, we see that your, your disciples are doing that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. And then they questioned him. Why do your disciples eat without washing their hands? So they wanted answers from Jesus. And so Jesus taught something that was very important. He said, it's not that which enters into you that defies you. It's that which comes out of you. And when he, when he said that, even the disciples had difficulty getting it. So they came to him later in the house and they said, Master, what did you mean what you said to those Jews? They were offended. And then Jesus said, don't you understand? It's not that which goes into you that defies you. It's what comes out of you. He said, because what comes out of you comes from your heart. And that's the point. So how can you say your hand caused you to sin? So Jesus says, if it's your hand that caused you to sin, cut it off. If it's your eye that caused you to sin, cut it out. So, question, where is your sin? Where is your sin? Jesus always wanted to point them to their hearts. He always wanted them to know where the problem was. The problem was not in the hand that they caught, you know, because the law said if they caught somebody, here and here was what they should do. Stone him to death, cut out this, cut out that. So, uh, tooth for tat, why did that man offend you? He hit you, okay. If he cut your hand off, you cut his hand off. All of these kind of things. Now Jesus says, the real sin is in the heart. The real sin is in the heart. So if you are going to cut off your hand to say, if my hand caused me to sin, question is, how did your hand cause you to sin? Does your hand have a mind of its own? Can your hand act on its own? Can your hand steal on its own? Can your eyes lost on their own? It's pointing you to something. He's pointing you to something. He's pointing you to your heart. That's what Jesus is doing. Pointing you to your heart. So you understand that. That's why he said it's better to go into life. Or to go into the kingdom. The kingdom of God. With one hand. Than to go to hell with two hands. So why don't you cut it? And it will be the Jews mind to say. But master. That my hand didn't make me do it. My hand was an agent. And they said, that's it. Oh, my eyes didn't make me do it. My eyes were an agent. Oh, that's it. So your eyes don't lost. Your hands don't steal. He said, out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts and thefts and blasphemies and so on and so forth. It's from the heart. So it's a heart that needs a change. And that's what he was getting at. That you need another heart. And that's what the prophet said, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you an out of flesh. You need another heart. That's what Jesus is saying. You've got to have it cut out and he'll give you a new heart.
you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. I keep backsliding it's why do I keep backsliding I love God but why do I keep backsliding well, that's a genuine concern well um, there may be many reasons why you keep backsliding probably you are uh, you are concerned about things outside what the will of God really is for your life the first thing you have to do to stop backsliding is to set your heart on the Lord. Give Him your attention. He says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. And I want to read something to you from St. Mark's Gospel, 
chapter 4, something that Jesus said. You know, you, you study the, the verses from 1 to 20. He tells us about a man who went forth to sow, a sower that went forth to sow. And it says, as the man sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. And he told us the meaning of that. Some fell on hard ground, stony ground. And he told us the meaning of that. Then the, the, the third group, he said, the seeds fell among thorns. And I want to read that to you. He said, some seeds fell among thorns. And that's from verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. The seed yielded no fruit, because when it grew up, the thorns choked it. From verse 18, you know, Jesus explained this parable to his disciples. Well, I'll begin with verse 14, so you understand. It says, the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside. So the seed is the word of God. So it says, the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside. Where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. That's for those that fell by the wayside. See, they didn't even understand the word. And the word didn't have any time to grow. It says Satan came immediately and stole the word from their hearts. But then we go to verse 18. It says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the loss of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. See, it becometh unfruitful. So there's a reason why the word of God that has come into you instead of producing results and keeping you in the way is not happening. It's because you are receiving the word among thorns. You are allowing other things. We call them, listen to the names. It says, it says, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the loss of other things. All these choke the word of God in your life. And that's why you keep backsliding because you have things that are choking the word of God that has been sown into your heart. Now you can deal with these things. See, Jesus shows us that it's our responsibility. In St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, from verse 34, Jesus said this, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. See, you are the one to take charge of your heart. It says, lest at any time your heart become overcharged. It says, with suffering, drunkenness, cares of this life. Cares of this life. He doesn't want your heart to go after anything outside of the Lord. So it's up to you. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So, this is your responsibility. You are the one to stop yourself from backsliding. The Bible says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. As much as you see that you know, your labor is unto Him. So, He says here, and take it to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you. In other words, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So, because the Lord is coming again and He wants us to be steadfast, to be grounded in the Word of God. So that's important. God bless your ministry. I would like to know if Christianity has stages one must undergo to become a full-fledged Christian. There is this thing about baby Christians and mature Christians. Is that really true? Well, um, 
there are no stages to undergo to become a fully fledged or full fledged Christian. There are no stages. You become a full Christian at once when you are born again. You know, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ is a new creation, all things are passed away and all things have become new. You become a Christian once and at once. When you give your heart to Christ and you receive eternal life into your spirit, according to uh, Romans chapter 10 verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so that's the way you receive salvation. And once you receive salvation, you receive Christ into your heart, you receive eternal life. You become a new creation. That's what makes you a Christian. And you become a full Christian. Just like when a child is born, he's a full human being. See, he's not part, uh, part human being or partial human being. He doesn't have to grow to become a full-fledged human being. See, we're dealing with natures here. So, you become a full-fledged Christian once you are born again. But then, like you said, there's this thing about baby Christians and mature Christians. Yes, there is. The Bible does talk about it. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter, I'll just quickly read something to you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. You see that? Which means there is growth. Growth in Christianity. When, when you receive Christ, you start out your life like a newborn baby. So spiritual is the same thing. You, you start out your life like a newborn baby. So the Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So you grow from there. The more you learn the word, the more you study the word of God, the more you practice the word of God, the more you grow. And so that's what the Bible talks about. Again, that's why we're given ministers. There are ministry gifts given to the church, the body of Christ, to help us develop. I'm going to read that to you from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 4 from verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ see that so this all has to do with growth and development in verse 14 it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive see but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even christ see so he expects us to grow into christ see and when it says grow up in him in all things it doesn't mean that we are now coming into christ afresh but that in christ we grow so that's what he's talking about so there is the 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 reality of what you talked about the uh, baby christians and mature christians but mature christians are not people who have been in christ for a long time it is those who have grown in christ they've grown in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ in fact uh, second peter chapter 3 talks about that and i'd like to read that to you from the bible second peter chapter chapter 3 from verse 18 he says but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him be glory both now and forever amen then also when you study in 1st Corinthians uh, chapter 3 uh, beginning from chapter 2 actually in chapter 2 and then in chapter 3 does talk about uh, uh, carnal Christians and spiritual Christians baby Christians and so on if you also go into uh, the first epistle of St. John you read in chapter 2 it does talk about children and then it says young men and then fathers so there are stages in Christianity but you are a full-fledged Christian from the day you're born again you are as much a Christian as a mature person who has been in Christ for many years and who has grown maturely you see so you're, you're a full-fledged Christian like a baby in the natural world is a full-fledged human being like any adult but needing to grow so that he can live the full life you see live life to the full better put that way to live life to the full
to you on television today and as I am so depressed about life and not sure what to do, I decided to seek your advice. I have had it difficult in terms of family and jobs. I have sought God's help many times. However, nothing changes. I have reached a point where I can find no solution. Please advise me. What is God's purpose for me and why have I had difficulties in life? I am deeply touched by your your question here and uh, but uh, I've got an answer for you from God's Word and I want you to listen to this very carefully the last part of your question is where I want to begin from you said please advise me what is God's purpose for me and why have I had difficulties in life why have I had difficulties in life there are many people who have who have uh, a chain of difficulties in life continually having life hard why should they have a hard life let me read something to you from Proverbs chapter 13 there are two reasons why people have difficulties like this in life even if the Christians and I'll read the first one to you from Proverbs Chapter 13, verse 15. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. He says, Good understanding giveth favor. Good understanding. You now the Bible says, Get wisdom, get understanding. With all I get, and he says, To get understanding. Understanding God's word. You know, in Jesus' parable of the sower, he said the, the, the seeds, the first set of seeds fell by the wayside. He said the birds came and picked them up. And when he explained that, he said, those who receive seed by the wayside are those who hear the word of God and don't understand it. And so Satan comes immediately and steals still the word of God that was sown in their hearts. They couldn't understand the word. So he says to understand it. Now, he says, good understanding gives favor. Good understanding gives favor. Because if you have understanding, you function according to your understanding. You're living right now according to your understanding of things. And that's a big problem. Because it means you lack the true and adequate spiritual understanding of God's word and how the kingdom functions. Now, the next part of it is very, very um, Insightful, it says here, but the way of transgressors is hard. Now, the Bible describes sin as the transgression of the law. To transgress the law means that you violate the law. Now, this definition is given to us over in the New Testament rather than in the Old. It's the same. In the Old Testament, transgressing the law would mean transgressing the commandments given by Moses. In the New Testament, there was only one law that Jesus gave, which was the law of love. Now, after you're born again and the Holy Spirit has come to live within you, you discover it's really no longer a law. Yet it's a law. It's a law in the mind. But in the spirit, it has become a reality. Because the Bible says, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Now, that law actually is the law of love. Which means that God has called us to work and function in love. Now, if you don't function in love, you are a transgressor, which means you're transgressing the law of the New Testament, which is love. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. A new commandment. This is a new commandment. And he gave them this commandment before they were born again. Because while he was giving them that commandment, he hadn't gone to the cross. It wasn't possible for anyone to be born again until Jesus was born again, raised from the dead, that is. Now, after Jesus came out of the grave, it became possible when the Holy Spirit came to make anyone to receive that salvation and be born again. And with that, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. And you can function in it. It becomes your natural way of life. But you've got to do it. You've got to act it. Now, if you don't live in love, if you don't walk in love, 
you are a transgressor that is the new testament transgressor and the bible says the way of transgressors is hard so you're gonna have to look at your life turn the searchlight on your life and see are you walking in love towards those around you are you walking in love towards fellow believers are you walking in love what's your language like when you talk to others or do you vent your anger and frustration continually on others that might be the reason things have continually been hard for you because it says the way of transgressors is hard the second reason is ignorance Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 tells us my people let me read it to you my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God I will also forget thy children now that's very powerful I, there's so much for me to say to you there but I just want to pick out the first part of it which says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge for lack of knowledge you see they are destroyed they are defeated they are crushed for lack of knowledge what knowledge is he dealing with he's not talking here of ordinary human knowledge he's talking about the knowledge of spiritual things the knowledge of God the Bible says to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to grow in grace if you're growing in grace it means you're growing in favor but remember what we read good understanding gives favor that means good understanding will bring you what more grace like the Bible says he gives more grace so he says to grow in grace if you're gonna grow in grace it means you have to have more understanding of God's Word and that is very very important today my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge now what are you going to do start learning God's Word get the tapes get the books study the books listen to the message hear God's Word put it to work act on it live by it be sure to increase in spiritual knowledge see remember that the spirit world controls the physical world see and you can control the physical things in your life from the realm of the spirit but that will remain a cliche to you without ever coming into reality until you actually have the understanding of God's word you know there's something else that I'd like to read to you and it's in the book of Joshua chapter 1 the young man Joshua had just begun the ministry and the Lord showed him how to be a success in verse 8 chapter 1 he says this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success notice what he said to you he says this book of the law now in our day the this book of the law would be the Word of God all of God's Word because at that time all they had was the law but now we have all of God's Word the whole revelation has been given to us see and um, uh, particularly particularly the instructions we have the revelations we have over in the New Testament in the epistles particularly you can learn from all the others but particularly you have great revelation for the Christian walk in the epistles now he says this book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth you're gonna to have to learn to talk God's Word but you can't talk God's Word until it is resident in your heart for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh so he says this book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate there in day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein he tells you the results if you do this if you meditate continually in God's words says then thou shalt make thy way prosperous can you see it's your responsibility if you do this he says you will make your way prosperous your life will no longer be hard this is your responsibility you can make your life prosperous then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success good success so it's not about God wanting you to succeed or not wanting you to succeed he's already I mean you're a child of God he wants you to be a success and he's shown you how
you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. The first one was, what makes the Bible more authentic than any religious book? You didn't choose that one. What does the Passover mean to the Christian today? You didn't choose that. Is the celebration of Easter scriptural? You didn't choose that either. The one you chose is, is masturbation a sin? Now, many are involved in the act of masturbation and are continually tormented by their inability to quit. Being unsure of God's stand on it and generally believing it is a sin though there's no scripture directly addressing it. Is it really a sin? What does God really think about it? 
Well, as always, um, I've emphasized before that our um, our goal is to bring you information from God's Word, answers to questions, answers from the Word of God, not human opinions. In answering from God's Word, you have um, direct scriptures, you have uh, patterns, you may not find something exactly written in the scripture, but you might be given a pattern to follow. So you have um, precepts or by example. And so it's important for us to know Whatever we have been told, um, either it is coming from God's word or it's coming from someone's head, whatever it is. The first thing I would like to, to clarify is what is masturbation itself? What exactly is it? Masturbation is defined as stimulating one's own genitals for sexual pleasure. See, so you're stimulating yourself for a sexual feeling. Now, the importance of this definition is for us to understand exactly where it is going. Uh, the feeling that you get is a sensual feeling. That means it's a feeling of the senses. It's a... Um, uh, a pleasure you derive from yourself from touching your own body and then the kind of feelings we get sensuous feelings that we get can range from something as light as um, uh, touching your ear or putting something into your ear and you know there's a feeling you get and the ringing of the nose or sometimes even the rubbing of your body or massaging your body not because you got some pain or something there are all kinds of sensuous feelings that we get in our bodies now sensuous here meaning mere animal feeling meaning not spiritual just your body see those feelings that you get in your body now from the age of puberty you begin to discover some things about yourself and your genitals begin to make more sense to you than when you were younger plus that you become aware of your sexuality now that that makes masturbation which is um, purposely to derive this sensuous feeling which is more than just scratching your head and enjoying it or um, having some part of your body scratching you and, and you feel like you, you enjoy what you're doing. This is a little more than that because you're deriving the kind of sensual pleasure that goes into your emotions. That's what makes it a little more. But the reality is it's still your body. It's still your body. Now what goes on in your mind it's a totally different thing because whatever pleasure we derive in our bodies depends so much on us as individuals the fact is some people always demand more than others for example there are those who enjoy eating but even though they enjoy eating they eat their own food their own meals their own rations then there are those who enjoy eating more they eat theirs and eat the ones belonging to other people now what are you beginning to get there they are getting less restrained in their actions in their desire to satisfy their feelings in their desire to satisfy their hunger they're going more and more now that's the same thing that happens with masturbation or any other thing any other sensuous desire now remember, a sensuous feeling is not necessarily a sin. A sensuous desire is not necessarily a sin. In fact, it's not a sin. In the same way that sin consciousness is not a sin. You can have sin consciousness, the consciousness of sin, whereas you have not sinned. 
And that's actually the problem with a lot of people. There is no way in the word of God that suggests that masturbation is a sin. Because it's a pleasure that you derive for yourself. Now here, here's something that's very important. Just because somebody enjoys something doesn't mean he's going to continue doing it. Now there are many of you who are actually bound by a spirit of masturbation. Say, so is there such a spirit? Oh yes. Anything we continue to do and allow to control us will become an opportunity for Satan to seize the mastery in that area over us. Whether it's soft drinks you like to take, you can become as bound as someone who's an alcoholic. You see it? Anything that you let control you would eventually control you. There are people who may masturbate and not be controlled by masturbation. Because it's a purely sensual feeling. And it's your own body. And it's not the abuse of the body because you actually, like I said, it's a sensual uh, pleasure that you're deriving. So, you are not abusing yourself as some people say you are abusing yourself. It's not self-abuse. The problem is when that masturbation becomes a controller of your actions. Because it can control you. And once it begins to control you, you almost can't do without it. It's like the guy who cannot do without smoking. It's like the guy who cannot do without drinking. So anything that you let control you will eventually control you. And once you are controlled by anything, you have opened the door for satanic manipulation. And once Satan begins to manipulate your life, you got trouble. And there is where the real danger is. And that danger is in anything. So what you have to do with your life is to let nothing dominate you. Anything that you do without control, that means that you let control you and you are not controlling it. You're not in charge will eventually control your life and dominate you. And so that's where the problem of masturbation really is. Because it's something that, you know, the more pleasure you derive from it, the more you want to do it. For example, there are those who stick something into your, to their ears, they always endure it. And because of that, they're forever doing it. You always see them with this habit. It's become a habit. There are those, even though they're adults, love putting their fingers into their mouths and sucking. And they've done that all their lives and no one stopped them while they were growing up because it's more common with children and now as an adult they have these fingers in their mouths and they're sucking because they enjoy it some say that when they are reading adults and they say that they, they love sucking their fingers while they are reading what a habit they got it while they were young and nobody stopped them and so masturbation can also become a habit and when it becomes a habit there is where you lose control of yourself. There is where you lose control of yourself. And then it becomes a problem. So, whatever it is, no matter the sensual, sensual um, feeling that you get in anything, don't let it control you. It's so important. Don't let it control you. Sometimes we eat because we just enjoy the taste. Even though what we're eating has no nourishment of any kind we just enjoy the taste so we've given that over to our taste buds i remember somebody a, a minister of god one time a man of god he said god told him to stop taking coffee now god didn't tell everybody to stop it but god told him to stop it god can tell you to stop masturbation god can tell you to stop anything because it may be dangerous for you because god doesn't like anything to control you but whether masturbation itself is a sin, it's not a sin. But don't let it control you. Uh, there's a word in the scripture that's used in several verses. It's the word lasciviousness. And lasciviousness actually uh, from the Greek word aselgeia means wantonness, lewdness, absence of restraint, insatiable desire for pleasure, and licentiousness now when you have those words in your mind from that very word lasciviousness it will help you understand better um, what I want to explain to you here the first one is Ephesians chapter 4 verse 19 and I'll read from the Amplified Version 
in their spiritual apathy, they have become callous and past feeling and reckless and have abandoned themselves a prey to unbridled sensuality, eager and greedy to indulge in every form of impurity that their depraved desires may suggest and demand. It emphasizes an unrestrained way of living. We're talking about lasciviousness here. Another, another portion is 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3. By the way, the word lasciviousness you will not find in the Amplified Version just gives you those uh, expressions that are used in defining the word. Otherwise, you find the word particularly in the King James Version. So what I might do is read the King James Version first and then read the Amplified. I'll go back to the, um, to the last one I just read to you, which is Ephesians chapter 4 verse 19. King James. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. See, then compare that to, the, to what I read to you in the Amplified. Now I want to read another one, 1 Peter chapter 4 in verse 3 from the King James first. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. It says when we walked in lasciviousness. Now how does, Peter, how does the Amplified explain this? Says, for the time that is past already suffices for doing what the Gentiles like to do. Living as you have done in shameless, insolent wantonness. It says shameless, insolent wantonness. Then the last one is Jude. Jude has only one chapter. And we are reading verse 4. It says, For certain men have crept in stealthily. Let me read the King James first. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, from the Amplified, the same verse, For certain men have crept in stealthily, gaining entrance secretly by a side door. Their doom was predicted long ago on godly, impious, profane persons who pervert the grace, the spiritual blessing and favor of our God into lawlessness and wantonness and immorality and disown and deny our sole master and Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Now, all of this goes on to explain something to us about unrestrained desire because you remember we defined masturbation as stimulating your own genitals for sexual pleasure. Now, the desire here is for your own sensual feeling. The problem is when this goes to become unrestrained. That's why I said it's walking a tightrope. When it becomes unrestrained, it's your own body. So at that point, you haven't seen it. It's when this thing now takes a hold of your heart. For example, if you went into a shop and picked an item mistakenly and went home with it and didn't pay for it, and you got home and found out you picked that item mistakenly from the shop. Have you stolen? Not really. God is not going to hold you guilty of stealing. You may not even be uh, charged for stealing if you found out that you had it and then took it back. If you returned it to say, I mistakenly took this thing and I want to return it. Now, in some cases, returning it may even be difficult. Maybe because of damage or loss. But because your heart didn't have the motive of stealing it, you report it. Even though you took that thing, you took that item from the shop and went home with it without paying for it, you haven't stolen because your heart didn't intend stealing. You didn't covet that material to steal it. Now, what if you took it and you did the same thing, but the state of your heart was the intent to keep it for yourself? The intent to take it and have it for yourself. Now, the intent 
in your heart has changed everything. That's why Jesus said what I want to read to you now. In St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, from verse, I read to you from verse 18. And he said unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entered into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entered not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the drought, purging all the meats. Now, in verse 20, And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, and so on. He says, for from within the heart. You see, it has to do with the heart. The question is, even though the act itself has no problem, what's the state of your heart? It's the state of your heart that will determine whether or not you got this problem. And that's why you must purify your heart, purify your mind. And so, um, don't let the, the act of masturbation get a hold of you and destroy you. Because in itself, it's no sin, but it's walking the tightrope. I want to pray for you. I believe the Spirit of God has answered the questions. And um, you, can, you can help others learn the Word. One of the beautiful things about knowing God's Word is that it releases us. It doesn't give us a liberty to do wrong. It always gives us the liberty to please Him. You see, whenever we learn the truth, the truth sets us into a new level of liberty. It brings us into a new level of liberty. We find that God's word makes more sense to us. And then Satan loses the power to control us. As long as you think that something is wrong that is not wrong, and yet you find yourself doing it, Satan will hold you in bondage. If Satan can com convince you, if he can convince you that um, you must wear a scarf on your head before you pray, you got trouble. For example, if you don't have that scarf on when you pray, maybe you went somewhere and now you want to pray. Maybe you dressed and went nicely anywhere else. And now it's time to pray. You can get a scarf. You feel like God's not going to hear you. Or if you catch yourself praying without a scarf, you're just, oh my God, forgive me. That's going to be your problem. And Satan will make you feel like God's not answering your prayer. And you become spiritually ineffective. So when we show you from God's word, all of these things, you find that Satan's power to control you is lost. So your knowledge that masturbation is not a sin is not going to make you continue to masturbate because you don't want masturbation to become uh, a lord of your life. You don't want it to control your life. You don't want Satan to gain any opportunity into your life. So it doesn't make you do it more. It just takes the power of the devil off from controlling you and making you feel dirty and guilty. Halloween is an evil custom. Well, you need to first study the details about the Halloween. What is Halloween? If you're going to convince anybody, you need to have the facts. So that's what you need. First and foremost, get the facts about the subject. Then, and then only, can you have the details from uh, the Word of God to be able to produce references. And that's what you do. Any subject you know you want to talk about, you need to have the information. And she says, I want to know how I can love others. I would like to do it, but sometimes I don't. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, well, um, love 
is one of the qualities of recreated the human spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, I think um, for being a Christian, the Bible says that God is love. And if we are God's children, we're expected to love as well. And I, what I think um, Maureen needs to work on is um, probably go through First Corinthians, especially from um, chapter 13, from verse 4 downwards, to see the qualities mm -hmm. of love, how you can love and work at it. Because the Bible says, he that believe it in God is expected to walk in love. Yes, and the first principle for love is to accept others like yourself. That's the first principle. See, the, uh, it's called the golden rule by many, what Jesus said, do unto others what you would have them do to you. So that's the first principle of love. Look at others the, with the eyes with which you see yourself. And if you can consider them the way you consider yourself, you're just beginning to learn how to love. Okay. And don't let the devil deceive you and tell you that you don't have love. If you're born again, love is in your spirit because God is love. And you're born of love. That's your nature. can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, 
America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preacher's pictures, click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.